Welcome back to ECE 442-542. This video will be a review session for the final exam. The final exam is comprehensive and it's made up of 15 questions that will be distributed across the entire semester. It won't necessarily emphasize material that has been covered since exam number three, but exam material since exam number three will be on the exam, which is the state space-based material and maybe some of unit seven that we didn't cover on exam number three. The exam process, there's four pages of notes front and back. You can bring some Laplace and Z transform tables. Something that you might need to draw a straight line or a protractor to measure angles or maybe a compass to draw a circle. That's allowed. You can also bring your graphing calculator, but you won't be able to bring in any of your class notes, no books, no computer, no phone. The topics are actually contained in the syllabus as the course outcomes, and I would recommend that you go through and read each of these. I think there are 24 of those outcomes that when you read them, I would suggest that you try to actually formulate a problem and potentially then solve your own problem that you have formulated based on these course outcomes. For example, on number one, it says design a pure two-pole system that satisfies specified performance specifications like percent overshoot, peak time, settling time, and DC gain. You should be able to translate now performance specifications into two dominant poles in the z-plane, put those into a transfer function, and that would then satisfy course outcome number one. Similarly, with all the other 24, I won't read those to you, but those are found on the last two pages of your course syllabus, and they are here. Maybe I should not scroll too fast if you are trying to memorize each of those as I'm scrolling down. You have the benefit of being able to pause the video, and for that reason, I will then not slide too fast, but I'm not going to sit here and read through those to you. I will let you pause and read those to yourself or access the syllabus and read those from a printed page. Relative to the review, here is a picture, a graphic of what you are responsible for in terms of modeling, and this is discrete time modeling. You could have difference equations, you could have all delay block diagrams, you should be able to go back and forth between those two, you should be able to go back and forth between an all delay block diagram and a state space representation. Those are related by putting labeling the outputs of your delay blocks to be state variable components. Doing that obviously suggests that a state space representation is not unique since one block diagram could be labeled many, many different ways. You also should be able to go from a state space representation to a transfer function, obtain the state space matrices phi, gamma, h, and j, and then formulate a transfer function from that system representation in the frequency domain. If you start with a transfer function, can you cross multiply, inverse C transform, and inver end up with a difference equation? And again, you can now just start circling around this model. You should be able to go back and forth between any of those representations. And once you're given one of those representations and maybe an input waveform, can you compute the output from that particular system? Where now maybe your output is related to, let's say that your system 
has been described by a transfer function t of z and the input waveform, let's say, is r of z, you should be able to then z transform the input waveform. You now have a transfer function of the system that the input is being injected into. Multiply those together. Do a inverse z transform if you're trying to find y of l to obtain a closed form solution or if you're just asked for y of z or maybe you're just asked for the structure then you can start looking at the denominator polynomial in y of z factor that find the modes or the poles of that transform expression to obtain the structure or if you need the complete solution then you will have to formally go through find the partial fraction expansion and identify those partial fraction expansion coefficients to obtain a closed form solution for y of l. We really have just sort of talked now about z transforms and inverse z transforms, but in order to obtain a unique time domain signal or system description where a system description might be the pulse response of that system, we need the re region of convergence. And we can relate that region of convergence to the interval of support or the index range over which that signal or system's arguments are defined. If you're given a particular region of convergence in the z-plane, here we have a region of convergence that is actually bounded on the interior and exterior by poles of a, let's say, transfer function. Then we can talk about stability of that transfer function. In this case, stability you can't really infer until somebody sketches or tells you where the unit circle is located relative to that region of convergence but the region of convergence should also give you a indication as to what range on the indices are associated with that particular mode or the structure of that pole. If it just so happened that the unit circle was lying inside or was on top of the region of convergence, this green shaded is what I'm suggesting as the region of convergence. If in fact that's where the unit circle is, then this particular system would be corresponding to a stable or a bounded input, bounded output stable system. And you need to be able to go back and forth, know how to interpret whether you have a region of convergence that goes or is exterior to all of the poles corresponding to a causal or if it doesn't actually include infinity, maybe a right-sided sequence. Similarly, with respect to a disk in the z-plane that's interior to all of the poles, that now corresponds to a non-causal if it doesn't include the origin then it corresponds to a left-sided sequence. And as we've illustrated here, we have a two-sided sequence with the real pole actually corresponding to a causal behavior or for indices that are non-negative and these complex poles which are lying beyond the region of convergence correspond to indices that are negative. You also need to be able to perform discrete equivalence, and we sort of have two different camps. We have hold equivalence, and we have non-hold equivalence. For the hold equivalence, we've really just focused on zero-order hold equivalence, and that's the case where we have actually a hold device that's holding that analog signal U constant for a zero-order hold as it goes in or in between each of the in time indices values. So between sample periods we're holding the signal U constant as it goes into the system. That gives rise to a zero-order hold equivalent. 
and that system could be in the form of a transfer function g of s or a state space representation you need to be able to find the zero order hold equivalent for either case if you're given or if you have access to the transfer function then you simply insert another pole at the origin and then operate on that z transform of g of s over s by 1 minus c to the minus 1 that 1 minus c to the minus 1 over s is arising or comes about because of the hold but that then gives you a transfer function zero order hold equivalent g of z if you are given a state space representation the system matrix a the input matrix b you can now find the corresponding system matrix in the discrete time system phi capital phi by computing the matrix exponential e to the at and you can calculate the input matrix gamma as this integral that also involves this matrix exponential e to the a now our argument mu is allowed to vary under the integral sign and we can integrate that in together with the product of b if you have to manually or by hand compute this matrix exponential it might be to your benefit to formulate si minus a the inverse of that inverse laplace transform each of those elements in that square matrix and evaluate it at the time little t equal to the sample period capital t that's for the discrete equivalents that are based on preceding the plant or the system with a hold device if you have non-hold equivalents we talked about a couple different ways of doing that but here what we are saying is that we do not precede the controller or filter or the system with a hold device and we want to now trans Late that or find an equivalent of the analog filter or controller capital C of S we want to find its equivalent C of Z for the discrete time system and we talked about two different categories of doing that we have numerical integration which we have three different ways of doing forward backward and Tustin or we could do it by the pole zero mapping and the pole zero mapping you're using this relationship between the s domain and the z domain by z is equal to e to the st or remembering or trying to remind yourself z could be viewed as an advance operator and e to the st is an advance operation in the laplace setting again you have infinite zeros that you might need to worry about when you're using the pole zero mapping those will then correspond to z plus one factors in the numerator you'll want to match the gains which means that you might want to quickly think about what does c of s the analog transfer function look like is it low pass in nature if it is then maybe we want to match the gains at dc if it actually is favoring high frequency information or waveforms then we might want to match the gains at high frequency and the corresponding points in the z plane you will want to know for dc that corresponds to z equal to one and in this case when we do pole zero mapping we're mapping infinity to the point z equal minus one and there think about walking around the unit circle from z equal one a radius of one away from the origin all the way over to z equal to minus one and that then corresponds to all the frequencies that your system can have in the z domain we also learned how to translate performance specifications into dominant poles in the z-plane where now we have performance specifications we focused on three percent overshoot settling time and peak time and what do those correspond to in terms of shapes or behavior in the z-plane performance 
or percent overshoot corresponds to constant damping ratio lines zeta or hearts and that I've tried to actually show with a graphic here now this is if you mirror that top half down into the negative imaginary axis that's where the heart is coming into play so that a, a damping ratio of 0.4 might have a reasonable heart shape to it some of the others maybe you have to use your imagination but here in this particular plot zeta equal to zero the damping having zero damping means we're on the unit circle and any poles there don't damp out if we looked at what happens here with zeta equal to one now we are on the real line between zero and one and we have an exponential behavior anything between that gives you then this possibility of having a little bit of oscillation in your second order system that possesses complex poles that have a damping ratio zeta between zero and one and you can see now that the heart starts to get smaller and starts to approach the real line as zeta goes from zero down to one and that's the constant damping ratio lines in the z-plane that's the hearts the settling time T of S corresponds to circles, concentric circles. Those are now, you could think of it as a target that you're interested in. And the smaller those circles are in the Z plane, this has a faster settling time than a circle that is exterior to that blue shaded region we also have talked about peak time and the peak time now is influenced by these angles where here is now theta sub d so if you have a particular peak time specification you can convert that if you know the sample period capital T or if peak time is specified in terms of a number of sample periods then you have some angle theta sub d in radians expressed as some fraction of pi. So theta sub d goes from zero on the real line all the way over to pi or 180 degrees, which is on the negative real axis in the z-plane. Those translations of performance specifications into desired regions in the z-plane we've talked about through a performance summary and percent overshoot and also dominant poles which I just sort of illustrated but let's remind ourselves of this performance specification summary and this has been presented in a previous lecture earlier in the semester but here you want to be able to go back and forth and I'm trying to indicate that on the right settling time again think of circles or R so T sub S and R if you're given T sub S then that's saying oh you're starting with a performance you're translating that into a pole that now performance T sub S which you can now translate into sample periods N sub S maps into a radius or if you're going the other direction if you now have a pole radius r from the dominant poles in some let's say closed loop transfer function now you're going from a pole to a performance and you can now determine the number of sample periods that will evolve before you get to a one percent position relative to where you started or that's now your settling time so you can now look at settling time circles as either going from performance to pole or pole to performance likewise with percent overshoot which are the hearts here if you're given a performance specification associated with per percent overshoot now you can translate that into a pole 
characteristic, which is on these constant damping ratio lines, zeta by this particular formula. And don't forget to take the square root of this ratio of terms. Or if you're given a pole in the complex <clears throat> plane, let's say that you now have been told that you have a pole at maybe 0.6 and point J.4, point now you can say, oh, in fact, that corresponds to a zeta of 0.5. Now you can translate that into a percent overshoot. You can now say, oh, I have a zeta of 0.5. That now corresponds to a zeta value of about 16%. And here is another page that illustrates, given a zeta value, that's a pole location or some characteristic of a pole. You can now translate that into a performance or a percent overshoot based on this equation or even from this diagram. Or if you're given the percent overshoot, you can say, oh, if somebody wants a 30% overshoot, that means that we need a zeta value of 0.35 or bigger or you could plug that into this formula to find what zeta value you need. If you have R and theta sub D, the polar form of your dominant poles, you can actually find the zeta. Once you have zeta, you can go back up to this formula or this picture, this functional description of the percent overshoot versus damping ratio and determine what that zeta value will produce in terms of percent overshoot. And I may try to supply or provide these pages on the final exam review page or material on the D2L website. Where were we? I don't think we were quite all the way through. We talked a little bit about the two different performance specifications of settling time and percent overshoot, starting with either going from performance to pole or pole to performance. If you're given a location in the Z plane, you can identify its zeta value and then compute the percent overshoot associated with that. Or if you now start with a peak time, then depending on whether you're given T sub P, you can now take that performance and map that into a pole location. This is now giving you the angle theta sub D relative to the real positive real line in the Z plane. Or if you now have a pole location, you can find its angle theta sub D with a protractor and compute the performance or how many sample periods is it going to take before you reach the peak time. Again, all of that information can be then related here. And I guess I should go on down and remind you that we also have this performance specification table, meaning if you are given two different parts of your closed loop poles, maybe you're given R your radius and your damping ratio, zeta, or maybe somebody's given you a settling time and a percent overshoot, you can now translate that into a polar form description, R at an angle theta sub D, by looking at the far right-hand column. And the others, obviously, can also provide an R at an angle of theta sub D. If you're given percent overshoot and time to peak, then you're on the third line. If you're given a settling time and a time to peak, you're now right in that middle row, and now you are given R at the angle theta sub D. So all of these particular performance specifications in closed loop or dominant pole locations, you should be comfortable going back and forth with those, and that actually naturally leads into
being able to find a desired transfer function, which we might want to do for one of our controller designs, and in particular, the Ragazzini controller design. But to use this constant damping ratio figure simply requires that you find either in polar form or rectangular form the location of your pole. And once you have that pole location, maybe it's at point 0.4 and plus J6, now you have a damping ratio of about 0.35. You can now come here and say, oh, I have a damping ratio of 0.35. That's going to correspond to a percent overshoot of about 30%. And that's a quick way to then translate these pole locations into performance specifications, and you should be able to go the other way also from performance specifications into desired dominant poles. And that's actually what takes us now into controller designs. We've looked at three different ways, really, of designing controllers. We have the Ragazzini design approach. We have transfer function-based designs, which we've talked about PID controllers, but we can also just have poles and zeros and build a controller from a collection of poles and zeros. That's our root locus-based controller design. And we completed this semester with state space-based designs. And let's quickly go through some of those. For example, if you now are looking at a design via Ragazzini or a Ragazzini controller design, somebody might give you a system to control. One of the first things you probably will want to do is find out what's the desired transfer function, and that could be based on performance specifications as we just discussed. In this case, if G sub 1 is our nominal system, we now need to worry about the constraints that the Ragazzini design approach imposes relative to using the design technique with a given system, and in this case, G sub 1. And really what you want to do is quickly start looking at these restrictions. The first restriction corresponds to pole zero excess, and in that case, here we have restriction one. That says that our desired closed loop transfer function T sub C of Z has what? Well, restriction one is worried about coming up with or generating a causal controller. In this case, the pole zero excess of T sub C of Z is determined by restriction 1, and now we want a pole 0 excess of at least 1, since that's the pole 0 excess of G sub 1 of Z. But other than that, you have no unstable zeros or no zeros outside the unit circle. You have no poles in your system outside the unit circle, so restrictions 2 and restrictions 3 are not in play, and nobody said anything about steady-state behavior or steady-state accuracy, so G sub 1 really could just be a controller designed for that with just imposing the first restriction or constraint from Ragazzini. Let's look at one that might be a little bit more involved in terms of having more restrictions in play. Here, what do we have? Well, restriction 1 now says that the pole 0 excess of our desired closed loop transfer function, which we've been calling T sub C of Z, pole 0 excess of T sub Z of Z must be at least one, since we have two poles and one finite zero, our pole zero excess in G sub two is one. So we need to have at least a pole zero excess of one to produce a causal controller. Do we need to worry about restriction two? 
in this particular plant. In fact, we do because we have an unstable zero. We need to include that unstable zero factor of Z minus two. And that now factor, Z minus two, is also a factor in our desired closed loop transfer function, T sub C of Z. Do we have any unstable poles? Yes, we do. So that means that restriction three is in play. And restriction three says that one minus T sub C of Z evaluated at that unstable pole location, which was at Z equal to 1.5, we need that transfer function to be equal to zero. I'm sorry, that expression to when evaluated at Z equal to 1.5 needs to vanish. And finally, we need to then be told, do we have any steady state accuracy specifications? And if we do, one of those could be that we need the DC gain of our closed loop transfer function to be equal to one. And if we have a DC gain of one, then that means that we have T sub C of Z, our desired closed loop transfer function, when evaluated at Z equal to one, needs to equal one. That's the Ragazzini design. We also now have, and I thought maybe something was messed up when I just did my drawing activity. With a PID controller, we may want to know then what are the benefits of these three different parts. And in particular, the integral part allows us to be concerned or thinking about steady state accuracy. So if we want to include or improve on the ability of our system to track a constant input waveform, we might want to then inject or have a integral term in our controller. And if somebody says design a PID controller, then you immediately know that you can use this structure. That's what we've agreed on in this class. You now need to decide where do you locate these two finite zeros. They could both be on the real line. Maybe they're complex conjugates of each other. And then what is the gain K to get you to the desired location in the z-plane with the introduction of this controller where the PID controller immediately forces a pole at the origin and a pole at z equal to 1. So you'll need to understand and be comfortable sketching the root loci, what happens when you have a certain collection of poles and zeros, and how do you use the root locus construction techniques during a design, a controller design activity. Suppose now that somebody says, I want you to show me what the root locus associated with this transfer function might be. Let's say this is now G sub 1. Hopefully this factored form of the root locus is comfortable for you. We could look at the poles. Those are our x's. We have a pole with the origin in this case, and we now have poles that have negative real parts. They're at minus one half, and they have imaginary components of one half. We now have poles there, and our zeros are complex, but they now are in the positive half of the z-plane with a real part of one fourth, and an imaginary component of one four. We now want to think about what's the root locus of this system look like or this configuration of poles and zeros and you should be able to start drawing or sketching that. Here is minus one half, here is j one half. I don't want to cloud that up or 
fill up the z-plane too much, but now we have one segment of the real line from the origin all the way to minus infinity belonging to the root locus for this particular diagram. But now what's our pole zero excess? Well, our pole zero excess is 3 minus 2, so we only have one asymptote, and it's going off at minus infinity. And now what happens? Well, it really depends on the sh distribution or how these poles and zeros are sort of relatively spaced. You could have something that comes down from here and re-enters. We know we're starting from the poles. What would help us here is finding what the departure angles from those poles are. Here I've drawn those angles or departures in the top pole to be bigger than 180 and less than 270, so it's somewhere between 180 and 270. But if this is the actual root locus behavior, then one of those poles after it re-enters the real line is going to go off to minus infinity. One's going to go off to the origin, but that's going to meet up with this pole coming from the origin. And now once these break away, they may now approach those zeros. And so we still have one asymptote, but now we could look at the arrival angle. And the way I've sketched it, the arrival angle is at about 180 degrees for that pole zero pattern. So you wouldn't necessarily know how to connect those unless the you were to calculate the departure angle and the arrival angle from the complex pole and the complex zero, which is why the knowing the rules for sketching a root locus can be very beneficial. Let's now look at one more. Here it's kind of the flip-flop of what we just had. Although now our zeros are a little bit further away, they're at one half and plus and minus j one half. The pole is at the origin and then at one fourth plus and minus j one fourth. And now what's going to happen? Again, it's going to depend on the departure angles and the re arrival angles. Now maybe the departure angle is minus 20 degrees and maybe the arrival angle is 180 again. And maybe the root locus looks something like that. But somebody would either have to calculate or you would have to be told what the departure angles and arrival angles are for that particular system of poles and zeros. Let's look at a general z-plane controller design. And here we have a zero at two. Let me try to label the z-plane a little bit. We have a zero at two. We have a pole at one and a half. And we have another pole at the origin. Our pole zero excess is one. So in fact, if we just had a constant controller, this pole would go there, and this pole would march off to the left along the real line. That's going to produce an unstable behavior because we always have a closed loop pole between three halves and two. So now we need to do something a little different to try to get us inside the unit circle simultaneously with all branches of our root locus. So how are we going to do that? Well, we might want to, and what can we never, never, never do? We never want to cancel poles and zeros outside the unit circle. We can put poles and zeros outside the unit circle. We just cannot use those to cancel poles and zeros outside the unit circle. One strategy might be, what if I now put a zero there? Now I have that segment of the real line that, as I crank up the gain k, will actually 
be on the root locus. The segment between now, the pole at one and a half and that zero, let's say at one and three quarters, is not going to be on the root locus. But I can't just put a zero. I have to accompany that with a pole because I need a causal controller. So maybe I have a pole down here. What am I doing? Now I'm saying my controller looks something like, let's say, Z minus 1.75. And I now have placed a pole, let's say, at 0.1. And can I now adjust the gain K? This now I have a branch between the two rightmost poles. And this, again, I kept, I preserved my pole zero excess. <clears throat> and that pole at the origin will start zipping off to minus infinity as I crank up the gain k. These two poles to the right, hopefully, will now break away somewhere inside the unit circle or to the left of one and then come around and re-enter the real line between those two zeros and what I'm hoping for is that maybe I can pick the gain to place I don't know why I can't seem to draw triangles the two complex poles and maybe that complex and the real pole there, I would need all three of those triangles to simultaneously be inside the unit circle by the choice of gain k. But this now illustrates you would have to verify that there's a breakaway point between those two poles that is actually interior to the unit circle and that for the gain values between the time when that rightmost pole gets inside the unit circle and before it exits, let's say at the box, hopefully that maybe occurs here before this pole goes through the unit circle at minus one. But those are the questions that you would need to investigate on the magnitude of the gain K. One more design technique or strategy that we have introduced is full state feedback and that now assumes that we have all the state variables available to measure and use scale them with this full state feedback gain matrix k so to have arbitrary capability to change the behavior of the system requires that our controllability matrix is full rank or that our system is controllable, once we have that, then we can find the gain matrix K by setting phi minus gamma K eigenvalues equal to the poles that we desire. And we do that now by creating a desired polynomial, delta sub D, and equating those with the determinant of zi minus phi sub c, where phi sub c contains these yet to be determined coefficients in our full state feedback gain matrix K. Again, full state feedback is worrying about changing the behavior of the system. We say behave, or we want a certain percent overshoot or settling time or peak time. That's the behavior. We can now adjust that by designing capital K. If we want to tell the system where to go, if we say, I want you to go to five degrees, or I want you to track this constant input of 20, then we need to introduce a non-zero reference input. And we've now talked about how do we select in earlier lectures, how do we select this reference input gain, capital N sub 1, to allow our system to track or follow constant inputs. And that now says that we might use N sub 1 or set N sub 1 in this expression, zi minus phi sub c inverse gamma N sub 1. <clears throat> 
this is now our closed loop transfer function between the reference input and the output. We now want, would potentially say what's the DC gain of that and if we set that equal to 1 that might now force the value of capital N sub 1 which might be a scalar if we have a single input single output system. I hope that now provides you with a little bit of a summary of what you need to be capable of doing and performing relative to the final exam. Good luck on your final exam in ECE 442-542.